So next, we're going to jump into the uh, central dogma of myology, really how life works in a sense. So I'm going to start off with kind of the super back to basics review of how this all works. So we've got our chromosomes, which are just basically a super, super long piece of DNA. And on that DNA, we have specific genes that code for specific functions. So I want you to think of DNA as just a big series of cookbooks, okay? And that genes are maybe a single recipe in each of those cookbooks. Well, a chromosome in your entire genome is actually going to look more like, you know, this is maybe a chromosome that's a shelf of cookbooks, but your genome is a whole library of these. Okay. So you've got your cookbooks here and you want to just figure out what one gene is doing. Well, that's like one specific recipe in a cookbook. Okay. So if you want to, this is kind of a weird kitchen. So in this case, uh, we have to copy our recipe out of the cookbook before we can take it to the kitchen. All right. So that's what transcription is doing. We're taking the information from DNA and putting it into a more mobile format that can actually go out to the kitchen, which in our case is the ribosomes. Okay, we're going to take that recipe and convert it into a end product, okay, our protein, our polypeptide, uh, which is maybe going to be an enzyme or a functional transport protein or collagen, something along those lines, all right? So here we've got a basic explanation of the central dogma of molecular biology, the idea that DNA is our starting point, the information in that is transcribed to RNA, and then the RNA information there is translated into what will be the final protein. This is coined by Francis Crick in 1958, but it is more complicated than that. So in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that, in that we have the replication of the DNA going on, where changes are accumulating via random mutation over time. Not just transcription, but there is a reverse transcription where mRNA can be scripted back into DNA. Uh, translation forms polypeptides, but that's going to combine with lots of different other polypeptides to actually give us phenotypes, all right? Along with non-coding RNAs, which can influence genotypes and gene expression, and all of those can also be influenced by environmental factors outside of the body's control. So the first step of gene expression is going to begin with transcription. Yes. This is where DNA is transcribed into a sequence of RNA, ribonucleic acid, which is different from DNA in that the sugar is not deoxyribose, but ribose. Uh, in deoxyribose, this OH group has been removed and replaced with just a hydrogen molecule. And then instead of thymine, we're going to have uracil as our base. So an ET is going to get substituted with U. Okay, so this is a uracil is another of the pyrimidines here along with, so cut. C-U-T, those are your pyrimidines because pyramids are sharp and they cut you. And then we're not going to go with the single strand definition for RNA because RNA does occur as a double strand. DNA can occur as a single strand, but a uh, better definition is that RNA is pretty short-lived and unstable, whereas DNA is more stable and remains intact for longer periods of time. RNA is very hard to extract and work with. DNA is a lot easier. So in transcription, one of the DNA strands is going to be red, and a new RNA strand is going to be built. That is what we call the template strand, the one that the RNA polymerase is going to be using as its template to build the new RNA. Okay. And the coding strand is the one that's not being read, but it's actually going to match up to the RNA. So we're going to have AGGT here, the AGGU on the RNA. So we have our template strand and we have our coding strand. Okay. The coding strand is the five prime to three prime, which is going to match the RNA in the five prime to three prime direction. So in letter code here, same idea. The coding strand is going to look the same as the RNA, except for that substitution of uracil for thymine. The template strand is what actually is being processed through the polymerase in order to build that RNA strand. Okay. So when people are looking at a gene sequence, usually the coding strand is what is used when you look at a gene. However, different genes use different sides of the DNA. So it's a uh, really dependent on what gene you're looking at, whether or not the strand is the coding or the template strand. These two genes here are going in different directions on the different strands. 
This is actually on the X chromosome of the Drosophila genome, and this is the gene for cross-veinless here, which is going in a different direction than this gene right next to it, CG1349. Next, we have translation, the process wherein RNA is converted into polypeptides. Okay. Also, not all mRNAs are translated. Some are non-coding. They don't actually code for a polypeptide, but are still functional. An RNA transcript that is going to be translated is known as messenger RNA, and our shorthand for that is mRNA. So that's going to be uh, telling the ribosome what sequence of amino acids are going to build up into a polypeptide. That polypeptide is going to fold and assemble itself into a three-dimensional structure, which we'll get into more later. And then we have that structure, the protein, is going to determine what it can do, what its active sites are, what it binds to. The very first step there is translation. The rule of thumb for a long time has been that one gene codes for one polypeptide. Okay, so first gene ARG4 gets transcribed to RNA, that RNA is transcribed into a polypeptide, becomes an enzyme, that one enzyme catalyzes a reaction, blam, and you have one gene performing uh, one function. However, that is kind of simplified. Of course, there's always, in biology, it's always more complicated, right? So thanks to things like alternative splicing, one gene has the information to make multiple related, similar, but not exactly the same polypeptides. And then there are many genes that don't code for polypeptides at all. That non-coding RNA has its own function. Amino acids are the building blocks of polypeptides. So just like in DNA, where we have codons in a sequence, uh, or a protein is a whole bunch of amino acids in a sequence. You have your basic parts of an amino acid here, your amino or N-terminus, your carboxyl or your C-terminus, and then a high, one lone hydrogen here, and then your R group, your functional group, which changes depending on which amino acid you're looking at. There are 20 amino acids in naturally occurring proteins, okay? And you either get them from foods you eat where it's broken down, your body can build them itself, or larger macromolecules are broken down and you can get uh, amino acids out of those. So when we say protein shape determines function, the protein shape is determined by what amino acids are near each other or perhaps uh, what are available in um, active sites on that protein. So the main groups here are ones that have a charge, actively either have a positive or a negative charge. Okay, The side groups are polar, meaning that they're, they're not, um, that they're actually pretty hydrophilic. They're going to be attracted to water because water is also polar. All right, so we've got our positive and negative charge polar amino acids. We have polar amino acids that don't have a charge per se, but they're still hydrophilic. Okay, this group here. Uh, we have nonpolar side chains, ones that are not going to be attracted to water. They're actually going to be repelled by it. So we've got some hydrophobic um, amino acids here. And then some special case, cases, um, sulfur-containing glycine and proline, which is a, a ring formation here. So as these amino acids are added, they're added sequentially by the ribosome. And a peptide bond is what's going to be formed between the C terminus of one amino acid and the N terminus of the next, sort of like our DNA with our five prime to three prime bond. In this case, it's our C to N bond, our peptide bond here. It's also a um, dehydration synthesis reaction wherein water is lost. <clears throat> so just like our DNA has a five prime and three prime end, so do polypeptides. They have the N terminus on one side and the C terminus on the other end of the chain. As we go along our mRNA and read our bases, a uh, group of three bases is a codon, and that one codon codes for one amino acid. Okay, so AGG here codes for arginine, while well, UCC codes for serine. Um, there are multiple codons that can code for the same amino acid, but one codon will only ever code for one amino acid. And it's a little confusing. We'll get to that more later when we talk about the features of the genetic code. Okay. Codons are non-overlapping. They have a particular reading frame. Okay, so here's our first reading frame, where we start with the very first base, AGGUCC. Okay? 
Now if we shift our reading frame one base to the right and we start with GGU CCA, that gets us a totally different um, set of amino acids here. And we can do that one more time and go two amino acids in and we start with GUC. Okay? If we shifted one more, we're actually back to the first reading frame. We're just starting at the U. Okay? So each end uh, side of the DNA here has potentially three reading frames. And then if you're looking at it from the other direction, that's a whole four, five, and six. So we can actually have six total reading frames per segment of DNA. Okay. So this here's a, um, a couple examples of, uh, this is a eukaryote plasmodium genome and a bacterial genome where there's in each stretch of double stranded, stranded DNA, you have six possible reading frames. Okay, and genomes will make use of all of this information, uh, storage space, in order to have a whole bunch of different genes and, and things packed in as tightly as possible in the case of prokaryotes. So we've really got two languages here in molecular biology. Uh, we have what the nucleotide sequence of DNA and RNA are telling us, but then we also have what the amino acid sequence of proteins are telling us. Uh, in most cases, these match up very well, but in terms, when you're building a protein, there's a lot of other stuff that goes on. You can have um, uh, post-translational um, clipping and enzymes that break up a polypeptide and stitch it back together, things like that. So there's some interesting stuff going on when we look at proteins that wasn't going on when we look straight at the DNA and the RNA. So, however, they do have a lot of similarities in that they are assembled from smaller subunits and they require a bunch of energy in order to build. They're read in only one direction, okay? Well, in DNA, you're actually reading in one direction on one side and the opposite direction on the other side. You're still only going in one direction. And that the information content is embedded in the sequence of the subunits. It's the order of the subunits that really matters. RNA transcripts are not only translated with polypeptides. Like we said, there are non-coding RNAs, ones that don't code for polypeptides, which still have functions. And the one that first comes to mind is transfer RNA. The little RNA um, cloverleaf formation critters that bring the amino acids to the ribosomes in order to be assembled along the um, length of the mRNA. Okay? Then we have ribosomal RNA. Ribosomes are made up of both proteins and RNA. And so that is functional RNA. It's not coding for a protein. It's actually being used as an end product. MicroRNA is another one, and then we'll also talk about long non-coding RNAs. Okay. So we're going to get into those more later. Sometimes RNA can be converted to DNA by this process called reverse transcription. This is something that um, viruses actually do quite easily. The retroviruses is actually embed the coding material for their own production into the host genome's DNA. In the lab, RNA is pretty difficult to work with. You have to keep it at super cool temperatures, try and prevent RNase enzymes from breaking it down. So a lot of times you want to make a what's called a complementary DNA library. So you take your RNA and you copy it into complementary DNA using reverse transcriptase, and then you can synthesize the second DNA strand to make double-stranded DNA, which is even more stable. And this way you can take all your RNA sequences and basically convert them into DNA for storage and sequencing, and it's just a lot easier to work with.